So uh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And as time is short, I will, I will start immediately. And in a forward-looking exercise, um, it's always good to start by a uh, forward-looking exercise, such as the discussion that will follow um, and the topic of the roundtable. It's always good to start by, by looking back. And that's what I will do. I will uh, uh, start by my own uh, diagnosis of uh, what went wrong in the previous two uh, bailout programs. Uh, there is no doubt uh, we, we, are, we are already now running into uh, the third uh, fiscal adjustment bailout program. There is no doubt that uh, 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 the previous two uh, didn't succeed. If they had succeeded, uh, we wouldn't be uh, where we are uh, now, so the question I, I will ask first is uh, what exactly went wrong then? And let me make clear that uh, I was asked to uh, refrain from using uh, slides, uh, and, and so I did. Um, so uh, I will be as brief as I can. Um, I will uh, basically focus on uh, three, uh, four rather main uh, uh, drawbacks of the, of the first two um, uh, bailout programs, and obviously uh, those two programs differed between themselves uh, significantly, but uh, uh, for brevity, I will, I will group them together. Uh, so the first, uh, the first main drawback uh, to my mind is the, the fact that fiscal adjustment was um, uh, pro-cyclical, front-loaded, and quite aggressive. Fiscal adjustment was uh, much needed, there is no doubt about that, given the size of uh, the problem with primary, primary deficits exceeding 10% of GDP back in 2010. But in fiscal policy, pace matters. And uh, the actual size and speed of adjustment was massive and their consequences were severely underestimated. Uh, and they were underestimated at the expense of the biggest recession uh, in post-war history in peacetime. So this one, this is the first lesson, this is uh, lesson number one uh, uh, on the basis of which we negotiated the new uh, third bailout uh, program. Of course, a more gradualist approach would require a significantly bigger envelope, financing envelope, unless fiscal adjustment was accompanied also by debt restructuring. And this brings me to the second main drawback of the first two programs. Debt restructuring should have come up front at the beginning of the first program and not as late as it actually came. The, benefit of, the benefits of debt restructuring in 2012 were material and significant, but debt restructuring came late came when the economy was already in depression and the environment was contaminated by significant uncertainty. Hence, the fruits didn't uh, deliver. Point number three, the sequencing of structural reforms in the actual policy mix was ill-designed. If you take a look again, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have the graph with me as I was asked not to have, uh, uh, slides, if you take a quick look in the relative uh, price index between Greece and uh, 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 the, the, the uh, trading partners in Europe, you will see uh, between 2010 and 2014 a mild improvement in competitiveness in the territory of 8 to 10 percent. If you do the same using the relative unit labor cost, the improvement is much more significant. It's in the territory of 30%. Plenty of adjustment in the labor market, very little adjustment in the product market, very little gain, if you like, in terms of competitiveness. In point number four, bank recapitalizations were not accompanied by the creation of a structured and well-regulated non-performing loans markets. These are the four main points, if you like, the four main drawbacks upon which the negotiation, the technical negotiation, 
of the bailout program from the end of April 2015 to the beginning of June 2015 was based. As a result, fiscal policy in the third bailout program is much more milder with a significant reduction of primary surplus targets. Let me remind you that in 2016, the commitment of the previous government would be for a primary fiscal target of 4.5%. In 2016, our commitment is for a primary fiscal target of 0.5%. The necessary remaining fiscal adjustment is now spread over three years. It's of the, as you all know, it's of the size of 3% uh, of, uh, of GDP is now spread, uh, is phased in over a three-year period. It's much more milder and uh, therefore much easier to, to deal with. Point number two, emphasis has been given on structural fiscal issues, mainly strengthening the credibility of uh, fiscal policy and fiscal institutions. And let me come now to the uh, uh, often raised point of lowering primary fiscal targets in the lifetime of the program. I think this would be counterproductive. Obviously, the lower prim primary fiscal targets, the better for the government, the better for any government, exactly because it creates fiscal space and it allows the government to cope with, um, uh, cope with the consequences of, uh, of the fiscal adjustment easier. But a commitment is a commitment. And the commitment of this government is to deliver primary fiscal targets of 0 0.5, 1.75, and 3.5 percent up until 2018. And we have to honor this commitment if we, if we uh, want to restore um, uh, and, and enhance uh, credibility. However, we need to reconsider the level of primary fiscal targets beyond the lifetime of the program after 2018. And again, our preference is for a significant, uh, uh, significantly lower primary fiscal target be beyond 2018 um, in the range of 1.5 to 2 percent in the medium run. The second main lesson that we drew and upon which the, uh, the um, uh, third bailout, bailout program was based is that bank recapitalization should have been accompanied by the creation of a non-performing loans market, and that's exactly what we completed a little while ago. Overall, till now, the fiscal and financial pillar of the third bailout program are pretty much completed. And the foundations for economic recovery are uh, already here. Stability has been restored. The primary fiscal targets will be uh, achieved with the measures already, uh, already legislated. We all know that fiscal adjustment can potentially be recessionary, uh, but uh, we, have, um, we will, uh, we will um, uh, offset the consequences, the recessionary consequences, by injecting 2% of GDP in the real economy, the form of pay, paying back arrears over the next four months. And the liquidity situation is much uh, much improved relative to where it was um, a year, a year and a half uh, ago. And the expectation of uh, the ECB restoring the waiver um, on June 22nd and soon after, uh, perhaps next fall, uh, uh, including Greece in the uh, QE program, um, will improve uh, the liquidity conditions uh, uh, even, uh, even more. What remains to be done? I think there are three key issues. One issue is to broaden the tax base and spread the cost of adjustment as well as the benefits of recovery as equally as possible. Second, redress the wrong sequencing of reforms by emphasizing and prioritizing product market reforms. And uh, what I have in mind here is the creation of a much better business environment with significant improvements on how quickly a business can open and close with a significant second chance to business that go bankrupt and with significant improvements in the justice uh, system. But of course, we also face uh, a number of uh, downside risks. Some of them are global, 
and well-known, I, I won't repeat them here. Some of them are idiosyncratic. If I were to identify one main downside risk, that would be complacency. Economic recovery will come, and will come starting from quarter three of 2015. But economic recovery won't be sustained and won't be at the rate that we need as we close the output gap towards 2021-22, unless we are able to attract significant public and private investment. We need, therefore, a new narrative. We need a new approach towards private investment. And we need a much more friendly business environment than what we had so far. I'll stop here. Thank you.